Chicano's author, cartoonist, screenplay writer, and playwright Jules Pfeiffer approach the art of the picture book, he'll join us to talk about his latest book for children, Smart George. In what way did John and Jesse Fremont invent modern celebrity? Author and host of Morning Edition, Steve Inskeep, will join us to talk about his book, Imperfect Union. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the publishing world. Plus, our critics will be here to talk about the latest in literary criticism. This is the Book Review Podcast from the New York Times. It's July 3rd. I'm Pamela Paul. Jules Pfeiffer joins us now. Jules has probably one of the longest, most accomplished and impressive resumes out there. I'm just going to list all of his titles, everything he's done, and I probably missed several things. He is, of course, a cartoonist, a playwright, a screenwriter, a children's book author, an illustrator. He has won a Pulitzer Prize, a George Polk Award. He has written memoirs. He has collections of his work over time. He's won an Academy Award. I, I don't know what award he hasn't won, and I don't know anyone <laughs> who is not, anyone who likes words and pictures who is not a huge Jules Pfeiffer fan. So Jules, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Well, I can't top that introduction, so I'm getting off the phone. Okay, goodbye. Um, <laughs> so we're here to talk specifically about your latest book. It's a picture book. It's called Smart George. I want to talk about that and about many other things. But let's start with Smart George, which is a, a sequel of sorts to Bark George, which was an earlier picture book that came out in 1999. What made you want to go back and revisit this dog? Well, I wanted to go back basically, essentially a year or two later, because I love the character of George. I thought there was more to do with him. It was never far from my mind as the years went by, and I had no luck in coming up with any ideas, that someday, somehow, George would would make a comeback. because He, he was one of my favorite characters. I thought I could do more with him. And finally, 29 years later, well, actually, you took, I would say 27 because it's 29 now. But a couple of years ago, I now live on the east end of Long Island. And, and I had to go into New York for something I did, really didn't want to do. I can no longer drive because of a macular condition with my eyes. So in the hired car, taking me into the city to something I hated to do, I thought, well, I'm going to make something pleasant out of this trip. I'm going to have a sequel to George by the time we return. And so that was my mission. And by the time we turned, I had I had written the sequel. <laughs> Excellent. So for people that aren't familiar with George, and of course, you really want to see George to understand him. Who is this character? Why did you want to go back to him? First of all, it was tempting in the first place because it was the most successful of all my picture books. I mean, I've loved equally all my picture books. And I would that all of them had sold as well as George did. But George was a... Uh, a, a bestseller right from the beginning. First of all, it was a great read aloud book, and people love to hear it read. You know, I could recite it you know, without going to the text uh, when I went to schools to speak to children. And I loved doing that. I loved entertaining them with George, and George was also fun to draw. He was easy to draw in big, bold strokes. It was the simplest drawing up to that point that I had done for kids. There was no downside. We have a lot of Jules Pfeiffer books around the house, and they're all in, I hate to say it, but sort of varying degrees of disrepair. You know, I have Backing Into Forward, a memoir of yours. I have Jules Pfeiffer's America, which one of my kids, my 13-year-old son, has been reading at the table while he eats. It's timely again, isn't it? It is timely again. And I have another one, also for kids, also with a dog on the cover and sitting in front of me, The Phantom Tollbooth, which, of course, was written by Norton Jester, and you did the illustrations. I'd love to hear a little bit of backstory on that book and how you got involved in it. Norton was my neighbor when we first met in Brooklyn Heights. I moved into this apartment on, I guess it was Hick Street, and I was on the third floor, something like that, and Norton was on the ground floor apartment, and we met taking out the garbage, and he started wisecracking at me, and I wisecracked back at him, and it, it never stopped. <laughs> the wisecracks continued. 
And uh, finally, oh, five, six, seven years later, we moved in together with a with a mutual friend, an Englishman named Max, to a duplex or triplex. I can't don't remember now. Just outside the Heights on, on Brooklyn Heights on Court Street, and Norton started coming down to the floor I was on to read me the story he was working on. That became the Phantom Toll Booth. I'm not sure he had the title then. And as he would read me things, I would just begin sketching uh, with no purpose in mind, no end in mind, until it became clear that uh, that every time he had a check, he'd come down and I'd draw. And so there was never any discussion of who would illustrate the book. It, it was basically a joint enterprise right from the start, and it was enormous fun. Well, neither one of us knew what we were getting into. Neither one of us had any idea what the book would become. And the book might never have become what it became if, uh, because it was clear that the traditional editors of children's books were not going to be interested in it because it was considered too, basically too smart. Right. And, <laughs> you can't uh, have that. My then wife, my first wife, Judy, got the idea of taking it to Jason Epstein at Random House, who had just started his own book line called Looking Glass Library. And Jason loved the book, and we went from there. There are things in this book, like telegrams, that no longer exist, but perhaps the most obvious thing is toll booths. Well, there is still, I guess, toll booths, but you go, you zip through them. You don't stop at a toll booth anymore, and there's no toll booth collector. I mean, everything about the book is out of date except for the book. Right. <laughs> well, you know, as you said, Jules Pfeiffer's America really isn't out of date. When you go back to a lot of your political cartooning, it feels very present. And I'm wondering, like, do you ever wish like, that you were still cartooning regularly in a newspaper if they still existed? I do a rough monthly cartoon for the online magazine Tablet which keeps me in politics. But it's not flattering to me to say that nothing's out of date because I was dealing with subjects where I hoped by pointing out what I was pointing out, along with others, that there would be some change in the society that would make these things out of date. I find it awful that Little Murders is still current, that Cardinal Knowledge is still current, that basically everything I've written is still current because this is a country that Gore Vidal once called us the United States of Amnesia. And I, and I think that's what our sense of history is. That's very depressing. <laughs> well, you... it, it is depressing, particularly in my case. You know, I'm not really you, out, but <laughs> particularly in my case, if behind the work was the sense that I could contribute to change and things would get better. Well, I con contributed to a lot, but whatever the changes were, they didn't necessarily put us in a better place. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is look at the world today and you realize that we may be in the worst period in our history. That's not what I had in mind. I mean, it's also a tough period, it seems to me, for political cartooning generally, although perhaps you're aware of a robust online world of political cartooning. But of course, many of the local papers, the free weeklies, the alternative weeklies no longer exist. And I wonder what you make of this, of the decline of those venues for political cartoons. It, it's a shame. I have an old and brilliant friend named Jeff Danziger who still works as a political cartoonist online, mostly. He's sending, he sends his stuff out to subscribers. And he remains wonderful. And there are a few others that I'm sure are very, very good. I don't see that many anymore. And it was once a thriving field. I had some wonderful friends for many years who were brilliant political cartoonists. And uh, when we got together, we had hilarious times destroying the government. And it's not there anymore. So, you know, I regret it. I regret the passing of all of the things that, that I both loved and hated because they were the vital part of who and what I am. We have lots of ways of commenting on the news right now, you know, online, on blogs, on social media, obviously, but not necessarily through political cartoons. And I wonder what you think political cartoons can do as a form of commentary that perhaps other forms can't. You know, I just saw a, a Stephen Colbert show from last night that I recorded with John Stewart on it. And I think John Stewart was the most astute 
social and political commentator we've had for many, many years in this country. And I've got such nostalgia for his commentary and his presence, which was a combination of what a good political cartoon was. It's sharp, pointed intelligence saying things that nobody else said up to that point. And you couldn't figure out once you heard it why everybody wasn't saying that. It seemed so obvious, except it wasn't until he said it. And the good political cartoonists did just that. Paul Conrad in the L.A. Times during his period, who was a great friend of mine, Herb Locke, of course, in the Washington Post, a number of others, Pat Oliphant. These guys, they shaped or they helped shape the world of commentary by the, the strength of their work, you know, which was simply unlike me. They only needed one panel. I needed six or seven because I needed to dramatize, and they didn't care about that. I mean, you've done everything, as I think I made clear in my introduction. I'm sure I missed a bunch of things. You've done political cartooning, comics, plays, screenplays, graphic novels, children's books, illustrations for other people's children's books. What gives you the greatest pleasure and reward? Is there one thing that you could sort of consider your true calling? Uh, my true calling is whatever I'm doing at the moment. I, I love them all, and I all, you know, and I think of it as all as in a straight line. I mean, in one way or another, whatever the form I'm working in, somehow or other, it deals with authority and 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 characters moving against authority. Whether it's for kids, whether it's for grown-ups, whether it's a play, whether it's whatever it is, a tap dance, whatever it happens to be, <laughs> it's my version of some kind of resistance to the status quo. I mean, that's what George is doing in Smart George. His mother wants him to do this. He wants to do that. Right. Now, this was not an intellectual choice when I came up with it. It's just the way my mind goes. He's a contrarian. Yes, yes. And and, uh, and I've always been a contrarian. I think if the world ever became exactly what I wanted it to be, I'd change my mind about it. <laughs> what in particular do you like about working on picture books? Marie Sendak was a friend of mine. And when I was got out of the army and trying to figure out a way of making a living. When was this? Well, this was in 1953. I got up some samples and uh, Ursula Nordstrom was the, the biggest honcho in the world of children's books at Harper's at the time. And, you know, anyway, I mean, she was she was it. And I got some samples up. Although I had no interest in children, I never wanted children. I was never going to have any children. And But it was a way of making some money. I needed to make a living, which I was not making at the time. And I took the samples to Harper's, and I saw Ursula. And she said, this reminds me of somebody. Come inside. I want you to meet. So I walked in, and she introduced me to someone named Bruce Sendak. And Maurice at that time was working on the Ruth Krauss wonderful book called The Hole is to Dig. And I don't know if you remember it, but it was it's a masterpiece. And and I looked at the book and I thought, well, I have to go into some other business. <laughs> 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 because it was so perfect. He was so perfect. Ruth's was text was so perfect. We we all became friends. Years later, when, by surprise, I became a parent, <laughs> much to much, much to my astonishment, because it was not my, it was not my game plan. Suddenly, I was interested in children and writing for children. And when I wrote my first novel, *The Man in the Ceiling*, I had an agent who knew nothing about children's books, and I called Maurice and said, I've just written my first children's book. I don't know what to do. I don't want to give it to my agent because he doesn't know a damn thing about it. And he said, there's only one person you can send it to, and that's Michael DiCapua at Harper's. And I was working up nerve to call up Michael when the phone rang. Saying, <laughs> and he said, this is Michael DiCapua. Maurice says, you have a book, and I send a messenger. And so the book went out. And exactly 24 hours later, Michael calls and said, I've been waiting 25 years for this book. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And that was the beginning of this relationship that goes on to this minute. <laughs> so that's a book that we actually have. And while we're on it, and I think it's still in print, tell us about that book. 
that first children's book. The Man in the Ceiling? Well, yeah. it, it, uh, it's, uh, again, like so much of what I do, going into theater, doing any of this stuff, it's never planned. It's all by accident. Of course, you know Ed Surreal's work. And Ed was had the idea of doing a, a, an autobiographical book about him as a kid in the Bronx and his love of show business and all of that. And But he didn't want to write the story. He wanted me to write the story, and he would illustrate it. And then he hated what I had written <laughs> <laughs> after we had worked together for a bit and, and rejected it. And I was so angry at him that I said, okay, you keep your children's book. I'll write my own children's book. My book will be better than your book. It was just this absolute – it all came out of being mad at Ed. And – and, and he and I talk about it to this day. Without, without me being mad at Ed, I never would have done children's books. What is the creative atmosphere today, you feel like, to you compared to that time? Well, remember, I'm an old fart now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there may be a lot going on. I mean, but I, you know, I talk a pretty good game, but after all, I'm, I'll be 92 in January. Dare I say, what the f- do I know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you've still been quite prolific recently. I mean, you did two graphic novels recently. You have this new picture book. Are you working on something else that we can yes, keep an eye out for? Yes, I'm, I'm always working on something. Well, part of it comes because of the change in my life. I'm, I, uh, I made a very happy marriage, finally, after all these years. And and uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with my with my life. And I love working. So, and, and guys like me don't retire. Readers like me and many others don't retire either. So we hope that you keep writing, drawing, cartooning, and everything else that you've done over the years so that we have lots more to enjoy. I've got a 10-year plan, and I I have to live to (laughs) to turn it out, and then I can rest. Excellent. Well, you're on year one, and we'll wait for the rest of it. Jules Pfeiffer, such a pleasure. Well, for me, too. I enjoyed it a lot. Jules Pfeiffer's newest picture book is called Smart George. It's wonderful. I highly recommend it. And also the original Bark George, which came out in 1999. Please go read these now, along with everything else that Jules Pfeiffer has ever written or drawn in his long career. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Steve Inskeep joins us now from Washington. He is, of course, the host of Morning Edition and also the author of a new book, Imperfect Union, How Jesse and John Fremont Mapped the West, Invented Celebrity, and Helped Cause the Civil War. That's a lot for them to do. Steve, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) I'm delighted to be here to talk about them. I'm sorry that you're not at our studio in New York. What is it like hosting Morning Edition during quarantine? Are you in a studio? Uh, I am not currently in a studio. I am in my basement. Sometime in late March, a lot of NPR people had already begun working from home. They decided that we should experiment with the program hosts working from home to increase the safety at our headquarters. And since then, I have been in this basement on a kind of kitchen table down here with a laptop and a microphone and a little bit of other equipment, but nothing too fancy, and doing the show from here, which is true of my co-hosts for this, my co-hosts for this podcast we do up first. There's just a very handful of people in our headquarters in Washington taking in the feeds from everywhere and putting the show out to you. And what's that been like? How is it different from doing the show from your regular studio? In some ways, it's better. My commute is a lot shorter, <laughs> right? which matters because I get up in the middle of the night. I get up uh, typically a little before three and try to begin to work by four. And uh, the show begins right at 5 a.m. Eastern time. No exceptions allowed, not even one second. And I used to have a 20-minute commute, and now I have about a 20-second commute. And I can stop on the way downstairs and get my own coffee rather than someone else's coffee. And the family is close by. I mean, as the day goes on, you have interviews. They may be like major newsmaker 
interviews. And I remember a few weeks ago, we were getting ready to record an interview with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I had a few spare minutes right before the interview and popped up and saw my kids. So it's positive in that way. Of course, it also makes it harder to separate your work and family life in any way whatsoever. And you don't have the face-to-face contact with your colleagues, which I really miss. But you get to sleep in until 3.30. Yes, exactly. I'm sleeping in a little later. That is exactly right. Even before quarantine and you were hosting Morning Edition on a regular basis, you managed to write this book. How did you write a book while hosting a daily radio show? Part of it is that the work on the book relates to the work on the news. I feel that I am covering different phases of the same giant story, the story of America. And when I got into this story of John and Jesse Fremont, this couple from the 19th century who were extraordinarily famous and who sought fame and also sought power and were involved in the exploration of the American West. And John became a presidential candidate, the first ever candidate of the Republican Party. I feel that I am exploring an earlier version of the news we're covering now. It's in many of the same locations. Occasionally, it's even in the same building. The U.S. Capitol is right there still, even though they have renovated it and enlarged it over the years. I've actually walked some of the rooms in the Capitol and the White House that I discuss in the book. And they are arguing in the 1840s and 50s over questions of national identity, who's an American, over questions of race, who gets to be a citizen based on their race, questions about immigration, questions about how the economy should be put together, how they should manage technology. There are issues about the news media because communications were getting so rapid and people found out they had difficulty dealing with the speed of communications in that time. It's many of the same issues we're still wrestling with now. Also an incredibly divisive time, obviously, in the decades running up to the Civil War. There's a clear parallel right now. The book came out a year ago. It's now out in paperback. Did you think anew about some of those parallels? Yes, I, I did think about those parallels. Now, I don't want to be one of those people who has an idea of the the present and tries to impose it on the past. In fact, I write at the end of the book that I want to be on guard against that sort of thing. I am aware that political leaders today will often justify their course by referring back to American history. They will refer back to precedents of other presidents. They will refer back to legal precedent. They will refer back to their idea of the founding fathers, which is all okay. We ought to do that sort of thing, but we ought to do it accurately. And in order to provide an accurate picture of the past, I need to let go of the present and try to understand people as they saw the world then and as the evidence showed then and what evidence is reliable that we can trust now. Because there's a lot of stuff that's accepted history that just is is off, sometimes subtly and sometimes very significantly. So I try to let go of the present. But in the end, I'm writing about the present. I'm doing this from my perspective, from my vantage point, as a guy from Indiana, as an American, as a person with a certain set of experiences as a journalist living in the 21st century and thinking about the past. So ultimately, what I write should inform, I hope, the way that we think about now, even though it's not supposed to be about now. Well, this is your third book, but your second history. Have you decided this is the kind of writing you want to do, that you like to go into the past and sort of look at it? Yeah, I wouldn't rule out doing some other kind of book sometime. And sometimes I think about very recent history. I sometimes think I would read a history of the past 20 or so years since 9-11, when so much has happened to me and for me personally, and when I've been all over the world, and, and so much has changed in the world over that time. So I'm interested in that too. But my writing has taken me in a different direction. And it's rewarding to be still thinking about the news, still thinking about politics and current events, but doing it in a totally different frame. And I'm now going on to write another history, and this will be a short biography of Lincoln. Oh, okay. So staying in roughly the same time period. I'm interested in how you were drawn to this particular subject. In a previous interview, you mentioned Time Life books. And I think my dad had that same Old West series, (laughs) like the sepia covers, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, In fact, I remember there were advertisements constantly running on whatever programs I saw on TV, and they would talk about the cover and say, has the feel of supple leather. 
Now it wasn't supple leather, whatever it was. But yes, the sepia tone photos or images would be in the middle of the in the middle of the cover in these brown books, and there was a whole series of them, and you would get them one at a time. They would come over a period of time, and as a kid, they were wondrous. They were wonderful. And you would read about the Old West from the perspective of soldiers who were fighting Indians. And then another book would arrive and you'd read about the Old West from the perspective of Indians who were fighting soldiers. And you'd read about pioneers and you'd read about the railroaders. And I was a kid and I loved trains. And that book, I remember reading so much that finally the spine fell apart. (laughs) And they were really rewarding. And my parents were really amazing in that way in that they made sure the house was stocked with books. They loved books anyway, but they made sure there were books that were appropriate for me or that I was interested in, and they were always up for taking me to the library and even leaving me at the library uh, when I was not very uh, old at all, and I could just spend hours there finding mystery stories, science fiction stories, and also histories, all kinds of things. Let's talk about the couple at the center of this book. John Fremont is a name that I think people have heard. They've heard of streets named Fremont Towns. His wife, Jessie, probably people have not heard of at all. But I don't think a lot of people necessarily know who John Fremont was. So just give us a a sense of, of who he was and why you wanted to focus on him. Absolutely. Fremont was an explorer of the American West in the time of Manifest Destiny. In fact, while he was out on one of his explorations, a newspaper man in New York John L. O'Sullivan, coined the term Manifest Destiny, talking about America's obvious destiny, he thought, to spread across the continent from sea to sea and take over the, the, the Pacific. And Fremont was involved in that. At the direction, as a U.S. military officer, he was acting at the direction of his father-in-law, who was a powerful U.S. senator, who wasn't in command of the army, but had influence because it was his son-in-law. And he sent his son-in-law off to explore the Oregon Trail, the pathways leading to Oregon, which was then disputed territory with Britain. But Fremont's father-in-law, the senator, thought if they enticed settlers to go, encouraged people to settle Oregon, it would become American. And John Fremont not only went and mapped the trail and made it clear how to go, it was really important that he come back and write a dramatic account of his adventure which got reprinted and excerpted in all kinds of newspapers and ultimately published as a variety of popular books, essentially best-selling works. And they were a guide to the trip and also an adventure story and also just an advertisement of the idea that the U.S. government supports you, settler, going to Oregon. It was an enticement because they couldn't force settlers to go. It was a republic and there were free citizens, but they could advertise in a way that sold people on the idea of going to the Willamette Valley in Oregon or wherever out there they might try to go. Fremont later also took an expedition to California, a couple of them, and was involved in conquering California for the United States. So he's all about the fact that we have a Pacific coast now. Now, he ended up being the first Republican presidential nominee. Of course, he didn't win. But how did he end up in the Republican Party and what were his politics like? Uh, His politics were a little foggy. And it is fair to say that he was ambitious and perhaps trimmed his views to fit the times. He didn't have any strong record against slavery. And we should mention that the Republican Party was founded as an anti-slavery party. Not an abolitionist party, oddly enough. They wanted to stop the spread of slavery while acknowledging that southern states had the right to practice slavery under the Constitution, but they wanted to stop its spread. So it was a political political platform rather than a moral platform. Yes, yes, although they imbued it with morality in that 1856 campaign. John Fremont was not strongly anti-slavery, but he was considered a huge hero. His wife, Jessie, who was a senator's daughter and deeply political herself, had a bit stronger sentiment against slavery, and they gravitated into the orbit of this party through the help of powerful politicians who Jesse was friends with because she was his political advisor and, and political ambassador in many ways. And the Republicans wanted somebody super famous without a long political record so they could unite the various factions of the party under his banner. And so they they went for this guy who did have an enormous reputation at the time. He I mentioned he was making the West famous, making the idea of settling the West famous. In the process of doing so, he made himself super famous. 
Let's talk about that fame, because in your subtitle, you say that they invented celebrity. What was celebrity like at that time? And in what ways did they, Jesse and and John Fremont, transform it? Here's what I mean by that. I don't mean to suggest there weren't famous people before. Obviously, there were. I don't even mean to suggest that there weren't people who, who rose to their accomplishments. But that's kind of the point. People would be famous because they were king. People would be famous because they were a victorious general. In some occasions in the capitals of Europe, in London and Paris, people would be famous because they were a greatly accomplished artist or a greatly accomplished writer. But they would be famous in a relatively limited way among the people who were in the know. And so it was a very limited kind of celebrity. The Fremonts invented a different form of celebrity where they used the rapidly expanding news media to promote themselves directly to the people, to promote themselves directly to the masses in ways that simply were not possible before. And they managed to promote themselves even as they were doing the things that they were famous for. They didn't do things like win a battle and then become famous. Fremont was promoting his expeditions to the West before he even began the the first one. There were big newspaper stories about the expedition before it even started. And he continued promoting it through the writings that he did. And in fact, promotion was the point. Was Jesse instrumental in promoting John Fremont's fame? Hugely, hugely. Or was it about both of them as a, a kind of power couple? I mean, to what extent was she part of the fame Or was she more about elevating his fame? I think she had to be subtle about this. This is a very ambitious woman who in some ways was brought up as a boy by her father, by which I simply mean he gave her experiences and education that in that time, with gender roles in that time, you would associate with boys. At some point, he said, it's time to become a woman now and stop this foolishness. But she persisted in advising her father and then advising her husband, and she had to operate through her husband, but she became his editor of these writings that we talked about, occasionally his ghostwriter, definitely his political advisor. She remained in Washington when he was out exploring the West for months or years at a time, and she would be his representative in Washington. She would write presidents and go visit presidents, because through her father, she knew them. And she would say, I know Mr. Fremont would want this. Like She was absolutely involved in that way. And she would go to newspaper editors and say, I've just received a letter from the West from my husband. Wouldn't you want to print this? She was his publicist in that respect. Now, just as John Fremont, by promoting the West, made himself famous also, Jessie Fremont, by promoting her husband, began to make herself famous Occasionally, she would write letters to someone defending her husband, and that letter would find its way into the newspaper, which meant that suddenly Jesse was commenting on political affairs. She became quite well known. And when they they ran for president, I guess I can say it that way, when he was nominated as the Republican nominee in 1856, she was lifted up as a symbol of the anti-slavery cause. Women were deeply involved in the anti-slavery movement. Women were at that moment in the process of beginning a long fight for the right to vote. She wasn't really involved in either of those fights very deeply, but she was taken up as a symbol of that cause enthusiastically by women who provided a lot of the energy of the new Republican Party. You've mentioned letters, and you also mentioned the media, and the obviously print media was the central sort of vehicle for any kind of celebrity at that time. Did your research involve going back through a lot of these papers and and the newspapers and magazine articles from the time, and where are they physically, or was this all online? Oh, uh, some of it's online, uh, but I'm really lucky to live near the Library of Congress, which has been the largest single source of research for all my books. And they have great Fremont papers. And you can go into a room at the Library of Congress and somebody brings out a bunch of boxes and you can go through the boxes and find a letter that John wrote in 1835. And it's like the actual letter. You can find campaign memorabilia from 1856 from the presidential campaign. And it's the actual material. There are also materials in libraries in California. I was able to send off for some of that. I also traveled out to California, saw some of the material myself, and also drove around some of the amazing landscapes that Fremont rode through on a horse. I went through some of the passes of the Sierra Nevada mountains. There's also stuff online. 
And one of the things that I found that was new for me that I think did not exist for any previous biographer of the Fremonts is that enormous numbers of 19th century newspapers are now digitized in such a way that they are searchable. And I was able to see the way that Jesse would plant a story in a Washington newspaper, say, and it would, over the next few weeks, appear in 40 other newspapers or 60 other newspapers across the country. You could watch the spread of their celebrity because these papers were increasingly connected by mail and then by telegraph, which was invented and made practical and spread across the country in their time. You could see how the news media were speeding up and becoming nationalized, and the Fremonts were right there at that moment to make themselves nationally famous. And a lot of journalists copying other journalists' work, I guess. <laughs> it yes, sounds yes, like a lot of aggregating going on. <laughs> yes, yes. It sounds like you had a bounty of research to draw on and that that a lot of that was really fun. But what was the most challenging aspect of telling this particular story? I think the hardest thing there for me is actually the selection of characters. I, when I write about someone, I want to write about someone who has left behind a lot of their own words and a lot of their own reliable words. I don't necessarily trust the spoken word in this respect. Like someone gives an oral history and recounts a conversation that they had from 40 years ago that a famous person supposedly said, it's hard to trust that. But if the character has left behind a lot of their own written words, I have something to work with. My previous book, Jackson Land, is about Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, and a Cherokee chief, John Ross, And of all the different Indian figures who dealt with Jackson that I could have chosen, it needed to be Ross because he was literate and literate in English and left behind many, many thousands of words, hundreds of letters, and not always the most revealing letters, not always the thing you would most want to know, but you have a record of his own words to work with and he could speak for himself. In that same way of the various women that I might have chosen to include in a narrative from the 19th century. Jesse is someone where there is a big record because many hundreds of her letters have survived. And she ultimately began writing in her own name. In fact, in the later years of their lives, they went broke. They had a fortune and John blew it in railroad investments. And Jesse began writing more and more to help support them. Magazine articles, which became books, and they were often memoirs of their previous experiences. And so I was able to get her point of view. I don't have to speculate about her point of view. Now, her writing is not always as straightforward as I would like. It doesn't always answer the questions that I want. She leaves things out, intensely personal things, in a kind of Victorian way. But you, again, have a record to work from and to analyze. And maybe if you compare her writings to other evidence, you can figure out what she was going through. Well, I imagine going back and reading actual stamped, mailed letters, local newspapers, things that don't exist as much as they once did was a kind of welcome contrast, perhaps, to the type of work that you do for your day job at NPR. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And of course, we're in this world where everything seems public and people are on Twitter all the time and giving you all kinds of Instagram photos of their locations and clues to their life and so forth, so forth. But uh, in a way, they may not reveal the most important things, right? You can say a lot about your life and not really say anything about your life. That's also true in some cases in my research here, because I'm going back to old newspaper articles and what people said about themselves in public. But to get their private letters and to compare those private letters to a chronology of what they were doing at the time and other evidence that I can gather, that's a privilege. And it's a privilege to try to reach across the generations and perceive a human being on the other side and to try to connect with that human being who's been long dead. That's a special privilege. Well, it it makes you feel a little bit sorry for historians of the future who are going to have to go through long Twitter threads rather than go through letters such as uh, Jesse Fremont's. Steve, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I've loved this. Thank you very much. Steve Inskeep is the author of Imperfect Union, How Jesse and John Fremont Mapped the West, Invented Celebrity, and Helped Cause the Civil War, and of course, the host of NPR's Morning Edition. 
Alexandra Alter joins us now with some news from the publishing world. Hey, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. Maybe I should say from the Trump publishing world because or the Trump adjacent publishing exactly, world. Exactly. Yes. From the overlapping world of lawsuits, politics and publishing, which these days really seems to involve one publisher, Simon & Schuster. So in the case of John Bolton's memoir, it was the Trump administration and the Justice Department that tried and failed to block publication. But in this case, it's actually the Trump family that is trying to prevent the release of Mary Trump's book. And they are arguing that she has violated a non-disclosure agreement that she signed more than 20 years ago. And the original complaint was filed by the president's brother, Robert Trump. And somewhat surprisingly, a judge granted a temporary restraining order against the book. But Simon Schuster appealed and the appellate judge vacated that order and said that the publisher is not bound to that confidentiality agreement. They never were party to that agreement. So it'll be interesting to see what happens later. There's going to be a hearing on July 10th. And one of the questions that remains is whether Mary Trump might still be bound by that agreement. This decision basically, you know, clears the way for the book to come out later this month. And in part of their legal filing, Simon & Schuster made an argument similar to what they made in the John Bolton case, which was that they'd printed the books, they'd edited them, and they no longer controlled a lot of copies. So when I read that, I thought, okay, the leaks are probably coming shortly. (laughs) According to the company, they have already printed about 75,000 copies of Mary Trump's book. And sent them out to booksellers too, right? They said they're printed, bound, and ready for publication, and that includes shipments to retail booksellers. Are you getting this constant like Groundhog Day feeling where I, you know, there's like (laughs) every hour it seemed like we were getting a new statement from Simon & Schuster's spokesperson letting us know, you know, the restraining order has been denied and it just, and it's like Bolton replaying itself all over again with Mary Trump's book. Exactly. I mean, the statements are very similarly worded and they're arriving regularly. And again, this sort of way the books then play out in the news cycle, it really drives readers' interest to tell, you know, when they hear that something is so controversial that someone's willing to go to court to prevent it from being released. Uh, Not surprisingly, Mary Trump's book is number one on Amazon. And John Bolton's book is number three. And Bolton's book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list this week as well. That's right. Part of the play for the publishers who are doing these books is, you know, when they when they do get it in legal entanglements, it actually bolsters sales often because it drives interest. It drives the news cycle. There's cable news coverage of the book. And this is all ahead of the publication date. So in some ways, apart from the hassle and the legal fees and things like that, it's actually a publicity boon when when they get into these kinds of entanglements. And that was demonstrated in the sales figures for John Bolton's book, The Room Where It Happened, which came out recently. And in its first week, it sold more than 780,000 copies. So Simon & Schuster has ordered an 11th printing of the book, and that will bring the number of hardcover copies to a million. So that shows pretty broad interest, despite all the criticism that John Bolton received across the board, across the political spectrum. Republicans were furious that he would attack the president. Democrats and liberals were furious that he wouldn't testify in the impeachment hearings, but rather waited to deliver the information in the form of a book for a reported $2 million advance. But Simon & Schuster is profiting quite a bit. And this isn't the last we're going to hear from Simon & Schuster and its authors, because doesn't Bob Woodward have another book coming? Yes, Bob Woodward has another book coming out this fall, which is a sequel to his 2018 bestseller, Fear, which was a reported investigation about the Trump administration. And that was a huge hit that sold around 2 million copies. So the fact that he has another book coming out shortly before the election, I think almost guarantees another bestseller for Simon & Schuster. All right. Well, it sounds like we've got lots more books to read before November 3rd. Alexandra, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Joining us now are critics Dwight Garner and Jennifer Salai to talk about the books they've been reading and reviewing recently. Jen, Dwight, nice to have you. Hey, Pamela. Good to be here. Hi, Pamela. So, Jen, let's start with you. What have you been reading and reviewing recently? So, most recently, I reviewed The Room Where It Happened, which is the new book by John Bolton, the former national security advisor to President Trump. 
And this is a book that probably for a lot of listeners and readers, they already heard maybe a little bit about because news of it leaked early in the year, in January, before the pandemic, when impeachment was still the central story in the national conversation. And at the center of that story was the Ukraine scandal. And so the question that kept coming up after, you know, a lot of testimony from people who worked in government and they testified before the House in the fall was, okay, can somebody directly link the president to asking the Ukrainians to basically look into his political rivals because he was worried about re-election in the fall. And it turned out that according to leaked information from this book by Bolton, that there did seem to be somebody who could make that link directly, and that was John Bolton. However, he had refused to testify before the House. He said he would only do it under subpoena. And then eventually when the news about the book leaked out, he said that he would testify in the Senate impeachment trial, and the Senate is controlled by fellow Republicans. He would do it under subpoena, and they didn't issue a subpoena, which everybody predicted would be what would happen. So news about this book was circulating. It was embargoed. So, you know, the details were kept secret other than the leaks that were reported in the press. And so the book finally came out. And, you know, it includes the information that people thought would be in there about the Ukraine scandal. It also includes information that Bolton said that he thought was troubling about how Trump was trying to basically convince you know, for example, the Chinese president Xi Jinping to help him with re-election. So, you know, I, I looked at this book, I guess, in terms of the information that's in it, because that's something that's important for people to know about, but also in terms of, you know, how does it read as a book? And I have to say that as a book, despite the amount of information that's in it, it really just reads sort of like a collection of John Bolton's notes. And he's, you know, he's famous for being a very fastidious note taker. And here he really took the opportunity to present, you know, everything that he documented during his 17 months as national security advisor. And so I think for people looking for information, it's in there. At the same time, the the main narrative thread of this book is not necessarily, I think, the sort of explosive, thrilling account that I think some people were hoping for. It's really more John Bolton saying, okay, here I am. I held this very important job, and here's what I saw. All right. You're one of the probably few people at this point who has fully read this book. So I have to, you know, whereas everyone else has read about it. Yeah. I have to ask, what was reading the book like for you as a reader and as a critic? There is always something very interesting and exciting about reading a book that, you know, that there's going to be some information in it that some people are very eager to hear about and know about. But the book itself, I mean, Bolton, you know, as a writer, He's not really good at telling a story. He presents a lot of things that he saw, not all of it entirely relevant. I mean, some of it is fascinating, but at the same time, it's sort of buried under this superfluous detail. And I think that's it, part of it is because I think he really feels like he's writing, here is his big book when he had this big job. And he knows that people are going to be paying attention, hanging on to every word. And so he really took the opportunity to, you know, structure it around the issues that he's really interested in. And it should be said that Bolton, I mean, I'm sure a lot of listeners know this, but Bolton, even though he's an establishment Republican, he's known for being one of the more extreme establishment Republicans in terms of, you know, his attitude toward foreign adversaries. And, you know, he he says in the book very explicitly, he says that he's in favor in general of what he calls disproportionate response, which means that when it comes to dealing with, say, Iran or North Korea, he doesn't hold back from his militant views. And that's something that also comes through very clearly in this book. It's interesting, isn't it, how he was sort of the bogeyman, you know, during during the Bush administration. He was the guy who wanted to bomb oh, yeah. everyone. He was the insane person, you know. You compared him, I think, to Yosemite Sam. I can't remember now. If you used Yosemite Sam, it was, it was a great image. But um, And now he gets to be the sane one, you know, which well, tells <laughs> you something about, about where... I know it's so, 
it's sort of the irony of all of this is that, you know, in in the context of the chaos of the administration that he documents, I mean, you know, the things that Bolton is advocating for, I mean, they haven't really changed over the decades. But, you know, in, just in terms of the president constantly changing his mind, not necessarily reading the briefings at all. I mean, it, it Bolton also because he presents his notes in a very methodical fashion you know on on a surface level it sounds very normal but at the same time when you get to certain parts of the book you know for example i mentioned the review the whole issue with iran you begin to see oh wait a second you know bolton's attitudes on these things are pretty extreme even in the context of the republicans i mean he's also interesting just as an author and a figure right now because Nobody seems to be on his side, you know, like he. Oh, yeah. uh, His political allies, to some extent, well, to a large extent, are sort of on the outs. And yet the people that would naturally consider themselves his adversaries also are it's people are eager to hear from him, but they wish they had heard from him way before. And of course, the people that he's speaking out against are furious. I wonder if you get that sense in the book or, I mean, he sounds incredibly self-confident from your review. There's a weird combination in the voice because there is a self-confidence. I would even say almost like an arrogance in terms of the way the book is structured and paced, you know, just in the sense that he doesn't feel the need to make any concessions toward what people would traditionally want from a story. But at the same time, you know, when he gets to the actual Ukraine stuff toward the end of the book, and then he has an epilogue where he explains why he didn't testify before the House, it gets sort of confused. I mean, I think to a certain extent, you know, he wants to maintain whatever connections and allegiances he still has within the Republican Party. So what he ends up doing is he places the blame for him not testifying on the House Democrats, which is sort of an interesting, weird maneuver. And it doesn't it doesn't come off well because it doesn't really work. I mean, he's basically saying that he didn't want to testify because he felt like their investigation should actually have been broader, that that it was focused too specifically on Ukraine and that it should have included these other things he mentioned in the book, but there was nothing that was stopping him from testifying to that effect and saying, this is what I saw, but he didn't do it. Given how explosive the contents of the book are, I thought the most damning word in your review was probably tedious, which makes me ask, Dwight, I hope you did not review something tedious this week, or did you? I, you know, every once in a while, I, I wrote in the margins of the book I'm reviewing now something like, you know, like snoozing here. You know, like, you know, like once in a while, I, in this, I reviewed the new Otessa Moshveg book, and it's called Death in Her Hands. And I love Otessa Moshveg. I mean, she's um, a young writer who's, you know, her books are pretty dark, pretty witty. Uh, her novel, My Year of Rest and Relaxation, and the collection of hers called Homesick for Another World are, are, are more than to, to, to the nth degree. And her new novel, which she wrote four or five years ago and put in a drawer, is starts out as kind of a cozy mystery story. This elderly woman, I mean, elderly, 72, the older I get, that seems younger and younger to me, moves to a lake in Maine by herself after her husband has died. And while walking her dog, finds a cryptic note in the woods, basically saying someone has died here, but there's no body. And this woman begins to spin out these elaborate scenarios in her mind about what might have happened, and she becomes kind of a sleuth herself. And it doesn't read this book, Death in Her Hands, like 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 a typical Moshfeg novel. It's written in a very sort of plain, simple style. She has kind of a high style that I that I really admire and and, and find sort of entrancing, and and that style is not in evidence here. And I once in a while this book bored me a little bit. I don't think it's among her best books. I don't think anyone will ever see it as sort of classic Moshveg. But you know, never underestimate her and never think she's only doing one thing at once. It becomes a very complicated meditation, a word I hate to say out loud, on the artist. I mean, the the woman is sort of writing her own mystery in her head. Is she is she, is she thinks of these stories. And it becomes quite complicated in its way. And I, I I respected it without really loving it. You know, I do want to bookmark for our future podcast a full discussion of words you hate to say aloud. Because <laughs> earlier I, I used the word robust, um, which is also a word that I, I shy away from ever 
articulating. Really? That's yes. sort of a robust what? meditation on a Tesla mosh pad. <laughs> why robust, Jen, you, you're asking? Yeah, why like, robust? What's wrong with robust? Yeah. Um, robust generally is used in a business context, and I don't love corporate speak, as you, I think, may know. So that's a word. Although that, I feel like they stole that word. It's like yeah, one give of those it back. Cor- yeah, I like robust debate, for example. I, I that's, yeah. that's a that's a I could use it that robust. Way. That's robust. Yeah. All right, we're gonna bring back <laughs> robust. <laughs> okay. All right, Dwight, Jen, let's run down the titles again. Jen, you reviewed. I reviewed the room where it happened by John Bolton, and I reviewed uh, Death in Her Hands, the new novel by Otessa Moshfeg. All right, Dwight, Jen, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much, thanks, Pamela. Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, not right away, but I do. The Book Review Podcast is produced by the great Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with a major assist from my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Mm-hmm.